The following conversation is with Wall Street Journal writer and author Abigail Schreier. Some of you may know Abigail. She has been going all over the place talking about her exploration of scientific, medical, mental health, and cultural conditions that have allowed for a sudden explosion of young teenage girls to experience gender dysphoria and the statistics and science behind that. More often than not, finding that a lot of these young boys and girls, girls especially, don't actually have gender dysphoria uh, but and are identifying as transgender. And so we're just unpacking in this conversation and having a little bit of a different conversation with Abigail that she hasn't really talked about on most podcasts, okay? Unpacking more of the root causes, why, behind the these reasons and why these things have occurred, okay, with gender dysphoria and this sudden explosion in America and how that's relevant for people across the world like us here in Australia who may see just the little seedlings of this pop up um, currently and in the near future. But what most was interesting to me about this conversation was that we got down to the nuts and bolts of like, okay, how, how can we actually address these things? Like, how can we give a foundation to our young boys and girls growing up especially girls, like what are the different education pieces, pieces of philosophy, the importance of religion and talking about books and resources and understanding history and how that can ground you and give you a framework to operate in and the importance of structure and that books and those solid resources and that they give you. And we talk about some of her mentors and really strong female role models that she has looked up to that other young girls and adolescents can look to as a source of inspiration to give them something that is solid and foundational. So I really, really enjoyed this conversation and I really did my best to send it in different directions. So if you've heard Abigail Schreier before, if you've watched a podcast for her before, I anticipate and hope and I did my best to deliver and uh, conduct a conversation where we could talk about some different things beyond um, what she has talked about at nauseum on her other podcast. If you want to know the nuts and bolts and the statistics of like gender dysphoria, like the Joe Rogan podcast is a great place for that. But for now, uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Abigail. She has a, she has a Bachelor of Philosophy from the University of Oxford. She's got the Eureta J. Kellett Fellowship and she studied law uh, at Yale Law School. This woman is very sophisticated, intelligent, and resilient. She's very tough and focused. And if there's one thing I got from that conversation is her openness and willingness um, to talk to everybody. And I really, really admire that about her. And I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Abigail Schreier. How are you and your family like personally doing? How are you managing the chaos right now amongst everything? So are you talking about the fires? The fire, where do we begin? Like so many people are exiting California. It's really interesting. Um, what do you make of everything like that? Um, we, we've had really bad governance. And when even though you when you have the best weather, when you have really, really badly um, run cities and, and, and state governance, you know, you, people leave. And that's mm. what's happened. We're getting way overtaxed. Um, no one's enforcing, you know, our police are getting defunded. Um, we have homeless people everywhere and many of them have mental problems. So it's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not great. Well, okay. That there's a lot of these underlying root causes in society that, uh, problems that have, we're now seeing bubbling up. And so I wonder, I want to talk about that stuff, but let's talk about what's the really topical thing and why we're here. And I don't know if you, I might the first Australian you've spoken to. Let's let's get at that out the way first. Say it again. Am I the first Australian you've spoken to? No. Oh. The, yeah, you're the second. Oh, well, I'll take that anyway. That that's cool. You're going all over the world. But my thing I wanted to start this conversation with one, thank you for doing this. Two, Australia often lags behind in America. Okay, the cultural, societal norms, our behaviors, we're not the same, but we're similar. Okay, okay. and. In regards to gender dysphoria, hormone replacement therapy for children, I feel like we might see that soon on the horizon, but there are these root causes that bubble below, okay, that are going to cause these issues like they did in America and in other countries. So I wonder if you could get a message out to all the Australians and parents and future parents to address those root causes ahead of time, what would you tell them 
Um, a, a big part in all this is social media. Very lonely kids are spending, adolescent kids, especially girls, are spending a lot of time on social media. They're feeling bad about themselves. They're feeling bad about their bodies. They're feeling left out. They're feeling inadequate. And unfortunately, they're finding all these gurus online who are advising them that if they don't feel perfectly female, um, they're probably a boy. Um, and testosterone, they'll say, you know, the, uh, these online gurus, these trans gurus will tell them um, the best they've ever felt is when they went on, started a course of testosterone. Right. Do you, and that's such a, I mean, I know you've taught, I've watched so many hours of you speaking about this and I really actually, I'm quite impressed about your, you know, your consistency. Like you are, you are really working very hard to. Oh, that's so nice. Spread yeah. and talk about these things. Like, I could not watch all the Abigail Schreier interviews out there because there are so many. Because you are just, I love how open you are to talk to everybody. But one root cause, social media. You've talked about that at no, at very commonly, okay? But let's, I want to dig deeper into that. Okay. How do you parent your children to manage social media. I want to like get into a bit of the nuances of like, do you think there should be a cutoff at like a certain age or like no devices or no social media until you have shown X, Y, and Z? How do you think about that? I do. Parents get very defensive about this and they think, oh, you know, because I mean, to be fair, the, the last generation of parent, you know, the last generation that came up that started with the social media, people weren't aware of how bad it was for, for young girls, especially. So now a lot of their, you know, daughters already already have their phones. But I would say, you know, if your daughter does not have a smartphone, definitely don't introduce it. And I don't think any of these girls under 18 should be on social media. They are not only having access to adults that you would not want in your home, people you would never invite into your own home, but are now able to reach your daughters. But they are feeling bad about their bodies and bad about themselves all the time by comparison. Teenage girls who are at the most vulnerable to this kind of comparison, and they're the cruelest to each other and to themselves. Um, and, and the social media allows 24 seven, it, you know, it's like a debutante ball that never ends. And it, it really is, it's really quite cruel. So I would, I would keep them off social media completely. I really would, to the extent you, you know, you can, there are these parent groups that come together and they all agree to ban smartphones or social media in a school or whatnot. I really encourage that. Is that what, I know you have children, right? How yeah. old are they? They're younger, so it's not as relevant yet for me, but I have my, my I have a nine, nine and seven year old. Have they, even begun like interacting at all with the iPads and the electronics? Like, how do you manage that? Because that's- Yeah, so I did a much better job before everybody went on Zoom. And now it's much, much harder now that the schools are pushing it. Yeah. Um, and, and the schools for the first time have a good excuse, which is the quarantine. Yeah. So um, it's it's hard. I mean, let, don't get me wrong, it's hard. Um, I, I don't like it. I think pen and paper is a much better, you know, pencil paper is a much better way to learn. And in person is a much better way to hang out with friends. Yeah. Um, they know I hate these, these things. Um, but you know, look, I keep, they're not on social media and I don't have any plans to get them a social, a smartphone at all. I don't, you know, I plan to get them a, a flip phone. But, but that said, I, you know, I'm not negatively judging parents who've done those things. I understand it. We weren't that aware of how nasty these devices could be um, and, and how nasty social media would be, especially for adolescent girls. Right. And so that's one of the huge root causes. And I think, okay, you've clearly defined, all right, before 18, no social media. That's your guideline and like value and axiom that's important to you. What do you think is another pillar and root cause to a lot of these issues you're talking about in your book? I think gender ideology in the school has to be opposed wherever you see it. There is no reason we can't show compassion for a transgender child without indoctrinating entire student populations in the idea that if they feel any discomfort in femininity, they might be a boy. Mm. It's proved a terribly confusing thing to teach young girls because they will be in crisis. They will go through an awkward period. They will hate their bodies at some point. And to constantly tell them that they have an out and that it will feel so good is really, it's really doing a lot of damage to these girls. Is there, in your book, 
did you I can't remember have you quantified exactly how many young girls um, have felt this teenage angst that is getting represented as something else like is there a way to measure that specifically that awkward period you know I don't know I, I I think it's almost universal I don't know a woman who didn't go through an awkward period who didn't hate her body at some point I mean even beautiful beautiful young girls hate their bodies at some point you know female puberty is really hard it's really dramatic you know um girls get their periods for their first time which is you know girls tend to be very you know high on the disgust meter meaning they're either very sensitive to things they find disgusting and blood yeah. would be one of those things yeah. so it's an extremely awkward period thing to manage uh, when it first comes on and it's also more painful in the beginning in the early years so it's they're, they're naturally going to have discomfort in their bodies you know the only reason any of us got through it is because we didn't think there was any alternative right and and now there is presented unlimited alternative which has its pros and cons when you have a daughter yes okay so it's going to be a couple of years approximately before her monarch begins and you're going to have to have those conversations and go through that period with her have you thought about what type of conversation how you'll conduct that to best support oh, that's her interesting um, to be honest, she's very young, but I've already sort of told her um, because I kind of wanted it to seem like a normal thing um, and, and not anything that has, you know, um, that, that is too worrisome. Um, so so she, she knows the, the basics that, you know, before you can have a, a become a woman and have a baby, um, you know, that, that those kind of changes happen. How often do you think parents are having those conversations with their children? Like, do you see that? Because traditionally in some households, it's like it's taboo. In others, they're more open. Do you think if parents like yourself could have more of those open, honest conversations, that there could be less confusion and more clarity? Actually, no. And I'll tell you why. Because okay. I think there are everybody, I think every young adolescent knows perhaps too much so these are kids who have seen porn at a young age, 11, 12. They have seen violent porn. They have heard about every kind of sexual kink. Um, if anything, they're not being sheltered and they're losing a little bit of the magic of growing up mm. and falling in love and all the things that you know romantic comedies used to provide um, and the culture sort of would, would, would um, you know, keep as an idol for them instead they are thrown you know they have they're having every kind of sexual and gender flavor thrown at them at a very young age and it's very confusing to them and it's very um it, instead of it being growing up being something they look forward to it really is um sort of a, a dark um uh, uh you know um thing to look look towards you have to make all these identity proclamations you have to immediately decide who you are and then select that identity on your social media site yeah. and you, you they see images of young women being choked within an inch of their life and they're told that this is what sex is right. or at least they're told by their computers um and, and so i think i think if anything they're they've got too much information and not enough sort of protective um romance and magic right interesting i wonder then how do you think parents can manage like your children at some point are going to come in contact with that i imagine right it's pro it's just a matter of fact you would assume so how do you best prepare a child to deal with it's like they're gonna get exposed to it how do you manage to prepare them you know, I don't know. I guess I would be open and, 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 and tell them, first of all, I don't want, I don't, I think seeing this violent porn is bad for boys and girls. Right. It's really not good for anyone. It's even resulting, a lot of this porn is resulting in erectile dysfunction for young men, something we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. We know it's not doing us any good. Um, and um, I think I would be open that that's not what sex is, that that's a bizarre um, imitation of it in a certain sense. And it's not, it's missing all of the beauty of a human relationship and a human connection. And I think that, you know, honestly, romanticized books and movies that depict love are, are definitely the sort of things to 
present kids to because I mean I mean I remember growing up you know whether it was you know 90210 or or you know a book I was reading romantic relationships were absolutely something I looked forward to about I mean that was when I thought about becoming a woman and today unfortunately they're not held up so all you see is sort of the brute mechanics of sex often depicted in really crude terms and even violent terms and it's frightening you talk about erectile dysfunction in young boys. I know porn addiction is a very serious and like consequential thing. Do you know any of the statistics on porn and how that influences the brain? I actually don't, no. Okay, well, I'm sure it's severe and probably alike to drugs in some way with that very dopamogenic um, stimulation it gives you. Uh, but that's the two pillars social media and you have the uh the second thing you mentioned but is there any other main pillars that you would see as being root causes to these issues well well first of all um they're very lonely okay they have very high rates of anxiety and depression the reason they're so lonely is connected to the social media they spend a lot of time online and a lot very little time with each other in person and when they are in person they're on their phones they, they aren't getting the comfort and the consolation and the, and the hugs that girls used to get from each other. Um, they aren't keeping diaries. Their diary exists online and it's public. Um, it, so they don't, they don't go into that haven either with their best girlfriends or even alone where they can reflect on things and grow up a bit and even go through a struggle. Um, and, and, and part of the problem, by the way, is that parents and, psych and especially therapists are very quick to diagnose them. So if they go through a, a, a hard time, if someone doesn't like them at school, be it a friend or a romantic interest or anyone, you know, there's no discomfort we let kids sit with today. Mm. And it's, we're really robbing them of the chance to move through it and, and learn to feel better about it and, and even grow up. So um, I think we're much too quick to intervene and try to fix things for them rather than either with medication or with changing the world around them, ra rather than letting them sit with something and move through it. When you have, when your children go through those struggles, or maybe you don't even have to get too personal, but I think that's a very big skill in itself. Like how do we parent and guide children to be able to sit through those things? When you have your kid or a parent come to you and say, my child is, is, doing this and that and they're very resistive and they're not sitting through it how do you bridge that gap to get them to sit with the discomfort i think just by stop helicoptering quite so much as we call it in america you know we're yeah. we're all over these kids we're parents my generation you know gen x i was born in 1978 so i'm at the tail end of gen x and we consider any discomfort our children experience as a crisis Mm. And we need to stop treating them like they're so fragile and let them just move through it. It's not the end of the world to feel lonely. It's not the end of the world to be dumped. And it's not the end of the world. That's not a trauma. And, and, and we need to stop treating it like that. Um, I was talking to a brilliant Irish um, psychotherapist who's, who I like a lot named Stella O'Malley. I really admire her work. And she was saying that, you know, um, one thing that Gen X parents don't do today is they never bother a child. They, they make the child's, uh, whatever the child is going through seem so important and whatever the parents are going through unimportant. Hmm. So if the parents are struggling to pay for their, their, you know, after school activities or going through a hard time with work, they never want to bother the child with that. But the second the child is at all in distress or unhappy, they make that, they change the whole world around them. And it's giving them the message that the moment they're unhappy, it's actually enormously significant. And instead, put it, being able to put a child in adolescence discomfort or unhappiness or you know um, distress in perspective is, is in some ways the best thing we could do for them is help them realize they're not the center of the world and you know what getting dumped is it hurts it's having someone not like you it hurts but it in the scheme of things it really it's not the end of the world and you're going to be just fine so that sounds like does that come down to just we're being too soft we're too soft on young kids and we're putting them in cotton wool and we need to let them take the pads off, get cuts and bruises and spend some time being uncomfortable. Is that where we're going? 
I, I think so. I mean, it depends what kind of discomfort, obviously. Sure. I'm not advising, don't, of course, I would never advise, you know, don't get your child therapy if they're in you know, profound distress or anything like that. You know, obviously I wouldn't say that, but I do think we need to refer to your own our own experiences. And if, you know, I, when I, I talk to parents all the time and one thing they'll tell me when they, you know, their daughters suddenly identify as transgender, sometimes they'll say to me, well, she went through a trauma that year. And I'll say, well, what was the trauma? And sometimes they'll say a boy didn't a boy dumped her or they'll say her grandmother died hmm. and it's not that those things aren't acutely painful they are but let's be honest it's a very normal thing to go through in adolescence to have a grandparent die at some point and in previous generations so many of us went through that and it wasn't a trauma because we understood that that was as painful as it was as part of life. And today we're regarding things that really aren't supposed to be the level of trauma as traumas. Right. And do you, th how do you think about then rituals? Like rituals coming into like, we don't have really a ritual. We have a, for death I'm talking about. Rituals for death, rituals for birth, rituals for, you know, these, these markers events like women there's the monarch there's the first menstrual cycle right? it's a very visceral feeling of um a girl into womanhood but that's even being confused now with everything going on boys it's it's a bit more confused like do you think about maybe our society is missing rituals and i know you are jewish and i know one thing working with clients like you guys have shabbat every friday there is this ritual where you celebrate come together you all have a common faith and a common belief to celebrate and explore this ritual. Do you think these rituals, if we created more of them, we could find a bit more, I don't know, peace and solution? I actually do. And I'll give you another example. You know, I was talking to another um, Jungian analyst I like a lot, who I interviewed in the book, Lisa Marciano, yep. who's um, really wonderful. And she made the point to me once when I was interviewing her, she said that we, we've lost our rituals for growing up, yeah. for proceeding from adolescence to adulthood. And like, basically, we don't have a secular bar mitzvah. And the problem with that is teenagers are desperate, adolescents are desperate to strike out on their own in some way and feel like adults. The problem is they're living at home, they don't have a job, they can't drive, they didn't get their license. Their whole lives are completely controlled by their mothers. And so they're desperate for some, some sign that they are not just an extension of their parents. And when they, when they don't have a place to find that, sometimes they go online and, and choose one of these identities. And that's the way, that's the only way they're able to sort of strike out on their own. It's their own version of hanging out in the mall and smoking a cigarette, which they're not allowed to do by their parents today but they're looking for something. So instead they go online and decide they're non-binary. And uh, stemming from not having, I think I know religion is important to you. You haven't spoke about it very much. Obviously it doesn't get touched on in your book, but going into like, all right, root causes again, like it seems like society has never been less connected to this idea of faith or a higher power um, in a, in, in, the, in the sense, in a technical sense, like Judaism, uh, Christianity, um, uh, whatever your denomination is, what do you think about that? I, I do think it's right. I mean, you, you might say it this way. So um, let me just say, I you know, I kept things like politics and religion out of the book because yeah. I didn't, I wanted to, I was writing an issue that I think really goes across politics and religion and it and it's not, it, it's not a, um, I, I, I think that it's the sort of thing we really all should come together on, whatever your religion, whatever your politics. But, um, but I think that and what, part of what you're, you're saying is that, you know, when you, religion offers structure yeah. and it doesn't mean it's the only structure, but it certainly offers a structure that can be really valuable to people and we're missing it today. Um, I think that religion does confer a sort of herd immunity on a population. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean individual religious people are better than individual secular people. I'm not saying that. I think that an atheist can be an incredibly wonderful person and every bit as good as a religious person, okay? 
but on a population, a religious population will have a certain sort of herd immunity to certain kind of moral nonsense. And the idea that the moment a, a teenager has an ephemeral feeling that she's not perfectly female, we should rush to put her on hormones that will forever alter her fertility and her body in ways she can't get back. That's the kind of, you know, sort of moral nonsense that I, I do think, you know, religion offers really good sort of breaks on. Um, that unfortunately we're missing today. That is that is really interesting, and I think that is a pretty big root cause. And it's the idea of structure. It's the idea that religion gives people psychological, philosophical structure, like a paradigm to think about and how to facilitate your way through this crazy, crazy life. And then it comes down to education. And we talked about that earlier at the start of this conversation, and that a lot of ed our schools are indoctrinating kids into just things that are just uh, incorrect, like scientifically incorrect ideologies. And I wondered if Abigail Shreya took a course, let's say Abigail, you can design a, you get to design the tertiary education or the high school education. You get to speak to these children. How do you give them a structure and system to navigate all this? You know, what's funny is we already have it. We're, we're sitting around trying to reinvent the real, but we already okay. have it. Western civilization has really provided a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom and, and learned experience, either through science or literature or philosophy. So many ideas and issues have been, have been debated and decided, and it's an incredible journey to read the canon and, and to wrestle with these things ourselves, and we don't do it right we sit around in our schools and we tell them that america is evil or the west is evil hmm. and um it was founded in slavery and we we feed them these completely you know unfortunately nonsensical stuff from a historical perspective and and also just bankrupt i mean there's something very sad about the there's nothing to learn if america is evil there's really almost nothing to learn from all that we've been through and all of our history so where do you go to learn i mean i guess you know you can, how many times can you read the communist manifesto um and it, it's just not we're really we, we pretend like we don't have these things but they're right there in our libraries we're just not using them what is or well, speaking of libraries i was going to ask this later but you have a very sizable library behind you and I've, every time i see watching your, your videos i'm like i wonder books and education they're such an amazing resource to give people structure and, and um just change their lives fundamentally behind you those books you've read what do you what would like what are the top three four five books that have really impacted you growing up you know, that's such an easy, no interesting question. No one's ever asked me that. Okay, there's a book by Kierkegaard. It's called The Present Age. It's absolutely brilliant. Okay. Um, I read it in college. It's, it's a book most people haven't heard of, but somehow a professor assigned it to me and I read it. And it's about the contemporary, and it's what's amazing is it was about Kierkegaard's age, but it's actually really current. And it's about the what he saw as the contemporary -ish impulse to destroy everything with sort of, it was an intellectual impulse to reduce everything to its constituent parts. And so that no no human achievement, no matter how remarkable, um, it looked remarkable anymore. It was an idea of that, we, that, the, that the sort of intellectual class was doing this. They were reducing all wonderful things that hu humans were capable of and humans were human beings had done to, you know, they had sort of taken all the parts together, let, laid them out and shown that they were actually weren't remarkable at all. And Kierkegaard saw this as a huge problem and a, and a very sad um, um, part of his age. And I think it's an incredibly current book. I don't know. I, it's been a while since I've read it, but that that's one that leaps to mind. That's really interesting because you can see, I don't know when that was written. It sounds like a while ago, but you can see this, the similarities and how relevant that is today. Did that inform you think you're writing? for this book today, even subconsciously? You know, everything I've, you know, I, I think that everything I read is in the back of my mind, you know, yeah. you know, there are fic there are authors of fiction who, who just write so beautifully, even though I write nonfiction that absolutely inform, you know, how I think about things. Um, but I think that had a big impact. I studied philosophy as an undergrad and I did some graduate work in philosophy and I studied 
uh, what they called in Oxford logic and language. So that was philosophical logic and philosophy of language. And I think that that's always in the back of my mind, especially with these trans activists who insist that they're, 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 they're going to change all of our language and give it new meaning. Um, Wittgenstein talks about whether you can have private language. Um, and 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 he he really you know argues against the possibility of private language. You know, one individual or a tiny group can't just decide that words mean something different from how a community of users has used that language because um, it's through use that we give words meaning. So you know, there a lot of these things are sort of in the back of the, my mind. Um, but but as, as I'm sure it's true for everyone. For sure, like I want to go in that direction, but I also want to like touch on. What is some? Is there a, another book that you that's been particularly resourceful philosophically for you over the years that you come back to? Maybe one that you gift the most to people. Um, I read a lot of fiction. Let me think. I I think that um, Caitlin Flanagan's Girl Land had a big impact on me when I read it. It was about she really nails what it's like. It wasn't that long ago that she wrote it, but the experience, the interiority of the experience of being an adolescent girl, I think she just absolutely nails it. And the importance for young girls of a diary and a space that's just for them uh, while they're going through a really confusing time. Um, I think she describes it really beautifully. And it's, it's, a, it's certainly a book that I've read a few times. Actually, here's one. You could gift a book, mandatory reading to every young girl in America high school which book are you giving them and maybe it's your own <laughs> or maybe besides your own what book would you give them to guide them through that process it's so funny you know i'm going to give you a funny answer but it's just a book i love there's a book called the idiot by alif bataman it's a work of fiction that came out in the last few years and it it just describes her experience being a freshman at harvard and I just love it. It's beautifully written and it, it really reminds me of, of all, all the confusion. And I, I think she just absolutely describes all the confusion of that, that, that sort of cusp of womanhood um, period of our lives really, really beautifully. So, and that's it, like, that, that's one book. Children, it's like very friendly for children. Like it's, it's an easier read. Oh, I, I probably wouldn't give it to young children, maybe, okay. maybe young teens um, for, for younger children. Um, Gosh, that's a good question. Uh, what do I like for that my kids and I have? There's so many things. I mean, we like Harry Potter, obviously. Um, the kids have all read it. We like a lot of Roald Dahl. I think I think that um, one of the I read a lot of Roald Dahl with the kids, um, in part because you know Roald Dahl really gets inside kids' heads and all the things that frighten children, and he describes them. He doesn't pander ever mm. to his audience. He really, it's very different from today's, you know, it's a, it's sort of a good antidote to today's insistence on, on hiding all the, you know, scary things in life from our children. He doesn't pander at all. And he lays bare sort of children's deepest fears. And somehow once you've gotten through reading them, those aren't, they aren't so scary anymore. Wow. That's really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll make a note of that. Now, last thing on books do you think like is there any other the on philosophy i know you did your philosophy undergrad and that has given you this supportive network and foundation to prop you up now to to write and do everything you're doing now and i think understanding philosophy and critical thinking is a missing piece in a lot of education when you go back to your philosophy undergrad, do you have this like one key or a couple takeaways that you use today that you would want to impart to other people? Oh, you know, I think that, I think more important than any um, one part of philosophy, I, I think it's just the impulse that, you know, I think it's G.K. Chesterton who said, you know, when a, when a, you know, fences put up, you know, basically some people have the impulse to, you know, immediately if they come upon a fence that they should tear it down yeah. if it looks useless and, and other, you know, others, I think you said conservatives have the, come upon it with the idea of, wait, let me, let me see why it was here. 
why it was put up before I go tearing it down. And I think the most important sort of attitude to bring to education and anything they study from philosophy to any anything else is what might I learn here? Hmm. And unfortunately, we are so focused on the ad hominem who had, you know, who had what to say about anything. Um, rather than looking at the ideas and trying to see what we might learn from them. If, if this young generation is in search of the perfect leader, let me tell you, there is none. The perfect writer, the perfect thinker, someone with no baggage, that, that doesn't exist. And so they're just going to have to keep daring down statues. The, the sad thing is there's so much to learn. And, and, and if they just brought that attitude towards half the thinkers they're trying to tear down or cancel, um, I think they would learn a lot. That's so it's so relevant and very poignant right now. And I wonder, people are so digged in their heels, right? How do you get people head in the sand, out of the sand? Or do you not even worry about those people? Because you have to focus your attention and energy on the young saplings that, that can be influenced in a more positive direction. Like, how do you put your energy towards these things and the people? It's very hard to talk to woke young people in their 20s today. I've tried to do it. It's very hard to get through to them. But I will say that younger kids, you know, absolutely you can instill a habit of, of questioning and wonder and free thinking yeah. and testing ideas. And sometimes that means having kids come out with ideas that you don't agree with. Yeah. I mean, I always, you know, I try to say to my kids, and look, I'm not a perfect parent. I'm, you know... It's hard raising kids. It's really hard. And I certainly don't pretend to be perfect at it, you know, um, by any means. But but I do try to at least aspire to letting them disagree and have their own views and testing an idea and understanding that if someone disagrees with you, that's okay. They're not insulting you. They're not hurting your feelings. They're not attacking you. They're having a dis different opinion. And that's actually a very, very valuable thing for everyone. And this this bleeds perfectly into what I actually wanted to talk to you about. You're, you're explaining to us and future parents, potentially like myself and other people, well, how do I teach my children to critically think? Okay, how do we teach the children and, and myself to objectively analyze information and see both sides? So that, I want to keep digging into that because that's so important. And I think if people could critically think and analyze all these ideas better, we would not have so much ideological chaos. And so how do you do that? How can we teach children to critically think better? So I think one of the biggest problems is not critical thinking, but a total lack of substantive knowledge. Um, I actually think okay. before a lot of these kids can be taught to critically think, yeah. they have to fill their brain with something to think critically about. Sure. And unfortunately, they don't have anything in there. So they come out with these, they think they're critically thinking, but they're not, partly because they don't know anything. Um, so I do think a basic education and, you know, exposure to literature, philosophy, poetry, you know, the, and history, these things can help you start. You have to have grist to start thinking about. Now, that's a very sort of unphilosophical thing to say because, you know, I tended to study analytic philosophy and, you know, that the idea of that is that you don't need to know anything. You just need to sort of have a rig rigorous and logical method. But I actually think we, we didn't, those analytic philosophers didn't envision a time in which we were this deeply ignorant about our basic history. Um, and, and certainly in the absence of, you know, any knowledge of what, how we work towards moral society and how we work towards the good and how other civilizations have done that or attempted it, um, it's very hard to even begin the project of critical thinking. Okay, that I wasn't expecting that answer, but it, it makes sense. It's like trying to build uh, a house on a weak foundation. It's like soft sand. It's like it can't be really done effectively. So you talked about a couple books before. So in that case, I want to keep digging into that. If you could give like a handful of books, you can list them off to then give like how do we? What is the foundation then? Like if if we could encapsulate it in a resource or a couple of books or something like what well, is it's it? hard to escape the bible as a book to to give um but for for and i'm not talking about it from a religious perspective necessarily i yeah. certainly have read it in college from a secular perspective as well 
but to, to appreciate the remarkable achievement and also the struggles of individuals in the Bible to see that they weren't perfect. In fact, they did all kinds of things they weren't supposed to do and, and how they worked past them. I know that that's something my own kids, you know, will bring up when something's hard for them, you know, they, they go to religious school. So it's very real to them that people, you know, the characters of the Bible are very, very real to them. And when they think about their own struggles, they think they, they refer to what these, you know, the men and women of the Bible went through. And, and I do think that's a very helpful foundational text to start with. If for the people who are averse, which is already a, a problem in of itself, because I think we should be open to like all different types of texts. Um, people who are more averse to that, that maybe that being the first or one of the first things, would you go like a more, is there a secular version of the Bible that tells an equally powerful story? Um, it's hard because I'm trying to think of something accessible to a child because that's what you were talking about. And, and the Bible is very accessible to children. I think that a lot of fiction prevents a moral order. I mean, you can use all kinds of books to talk to kids about right and wrong um, and their behavior. Um, you know, e even, you know, things like Harry Potter. I mean, those are wonderful books yeah. that, that help kids draw, you know, realize how important it is to be brave, how important it is to stand up for what's right and and how important it is to respect an institution that you're entering and and to begin by looking to learn from the people who have come before yeah that's really interesting because i think people look at these fiction stories and they they just see the superficial but what you also see that jk rowling has depicted is the two sides of good and evil and she depicts very clearly that harry is one and the same of voldemort okay he is equal sides, evil and good, right? It's just the, a choice and intention. You can philosophically dissect that very deeply. How do you think that, do you want to talk about that and how that plays into like just the good and evil of today's society? Right. I mean, I think that's a really important insight for kids to know that, you know, we pretend today that the world is so Manichaean that, yeah. that people can be neatly divided into good and bad. And we just have to tear down all the statues of the bad people and erect all the statues of the perfect people. And of course, that's not true. We're all tempted to act less good than we were capable of and to do things that are wrong. We're tempted all the time. And um, to remember that the sort of thin line separates us all from good, you know, people that we should be proud of and people that, that frankly, we, 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 we shouldn't be proud of and, and, and you know, perhaps we should, we, we should um, be, be ashamed of. I mean, really, it's, it, it's a thin line of behavior that separates the two. And, and that's something we should all strive to be better than we are. Right. There was this famous quote, like the line between good and evil runs between uh, every human heart. Um, have you heard of that before? No, I haven't, but that's right. Yeah. And let's go up now. Let's age up, right? Let's talk to our adolescents. They're a bit more older now, you know, later teenage years, and we can talk to them at a higher level. Um, now they can access pretty much all books. What would you give them to build that harder foundation instead of sand? You know, democracy in America, I mean, I didn't read it till I was in college, but parts of democracy in America are really wonderful, um, at least for American kids specifically. You know, he, he as, a, as an, obviously as an outsider, at not, not being an American, and he wrote, wrote about the, what was beautiful about American democracy. And in America, we really have a mythology about our democracy and about our founding, which we may not always live up to, but it's a beautiful ideal. And um, that kind of mythology of what we're all striving for is the what is the sort of mythology that sent prior generations to law school to hope to, to try to make the world a, a more just place or or to medicine to help make you know to care for each other better or all sorts of you know to get involved in government to try to make government more government fairer and more just. I mean, those are you know the, those kind of works um, that remind us that there is. We, we may not achieve the perfect democracy, but we should always keep striving. Um, that's, I think that's an important book for, for a young person to read. And, but how does that make you think about everything going on now? Like, does that upset you? Does it like it's such a contradiction or it's such a like, maybe not contradiction, uh, like the stuff and the mythology, the optimism that you read in those texts, how just disgruntled everything is now? How do, how do you think we get back to that mythology becoming a reality? Well, we stop, 
we stop the kinderarchy. We stop allowing rule by mobs and ruled by children. Okay. Right now we have a bunch of petulant children rushing through the streets. Um, you know, there, there's a few articles that have been written on the New York Post and a lot of the girls, you know, caught up in these riots who were out there looting and damaging property came from upper middle class families. These were rich girls. Um, what on earth is going on? I mean, I think that's what a lot of Americans want to know right now. And it may not come out in every poll, but the thing on most Americans' minds right now is how do we restore order and how do we stop putting up with the petulant screaming of these rioters who are abusing police officers, hmm. they're doing violence to, to other civilians and getting away with it. Um, it. There's really complete chaos right now. And we, we really need to restore order, order and stop putting up with it. And frankly, show more respect for ourselves and our institutions. And I, honestly, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but I think collectively we need this like the pandemic the the like australia had its own really harsh bushfires like protests um on and on chaos i think we need it because we've become soft and we need to become hardened do you like do you think this similar or not well i think you raise a really good point which is that this is completely tied into lockdown People have been cooped up yeah. in, in, I can tell you in Los Angeles, they wouldn't be even let young people use the basketball courts. They put locks across all our yep, basketball same. courts. What? In, in Melbourne, like it's, you think it's bad in Ca California. We have barely a touch of the cases and deaths that California has. And we have some of the harshest restrictions in, this, in, the, in the world. There's curfews, there's mandatory masks everywhere. There's huge fines. I won't go on, but it's, I feel you. It's it's very frustrating. You can't go to, you know, they restricted people's ability to go to church and they told them to sit at home. They couldn't work. And then, you know, I would take my kids to the park. We got shooed out of all areas of the park. We yeah. were chased out of parks yeah. and um, they had locks across our basketball hoops. We couldn't even use a basketball hoop. So you have young people, they can get no exercise. They can't be around each other. They have no community and certainly no experience of community. They're missing all the wonderful things about being human. Yeah. And they're pretty angry about it. And frankly, that's really understandable. And I think, if anything, that will just enforce that angst, that uh, frustration and emotion. Won't that just push more children just to find some type of peace in, you know, uh, there are a different gender, for example, and seeing more gender dysphoria because, well, they have to find some peace somewhere, right? That's interesting. I, I, I think that the lockdown has gone both ways. Young girls who are with their, who are being overseen by their parents more and spending less time freely online. Oh, yeah, great point. Are, are, are not necessarily indoctrinating as much, whereas okay. the girls who through lockdown have, I've heard both stories. Interesting. Girls who are spending a lot of time online unsupervised are find, finding these trans gurus and, and self-indoctrinating in this gender ideology. And the teachers are pushing it very hard. Um, so, you, you know, it, it's, it depends, but I yeah. think a lot of the ideology is coming from the schools, even over Zoom. And, and so some, some kids are getting more indoctrinated. Sometimes parents are finding out exactly what they've been learning. Yeah, so it's, Pros and cons on each end. Um, I know you have a... I want to I kind of close this last hell end of the conversation. I know, like, you have a strong aversion to lies. Like, and I know you pride yourself as being, like, this defender of truth. And it's rooted quite deeply, like, listening to you speak in your upbringing and, and your, your parenting. But before I go and talk about that, I wonder... In, we're being lied to in a lot of ways, okay? You illustrate a very big problem with gender dysphoria in your book. You've talked about all over the place. But I wonder, where else do you think we're being lied to in society that, that could be your next book? Well, it's a good question. What, what, what are the lies? I mean, the most obvious lies today and, and is, is the idea that man is a woman. You know, anything that they make you recite as dogma, um, which you know isn't true. I mean, a, a biological man is not a woman. I mean, they might be a, you know, trans woman or they might be someone who is a transgender adult, but that doesn't make them a woman. And, um, you know, this kind of lie that we can change, we, we, 
we, they, that someone gets to rewrite our words in, in the dictionary is constantly being updated right now in all these bizarre ways in response to mobs. Um, I, I think that, you know, there, there are a lot of lies told in society. I mean, gosh, one of them is just that if we obsess about race, we'll get along better. If we just absolutely obsess and never stop talking about race, hmm. and if we are abject enough and self-flagellate enough that somehow we will get along better, that's that's not true. Um, and I think we're seeing the res the reverse. I mean, people are less um, comfortable around each other right now because we're obsessed with it. With frankly, not the most important thing, which is what color a, a person's skin is. And um, something far from the most important thing about someone, but we're completely obsessed over it. We're obsessed with these identities. We're obsessed with sexual identity. We're obsessed with gender identity. You know, it used to be that someone's sexual identity was one part of what they, of who they were. And now it's in every bio. Mm. It's the most important thing. And we, it's so reductive of what it means to be a human being. Absolutely. Like we're, we're reductionists. We just narrow people down. It's like, you are this, you are that, right? You are this color. But that's a very interesting point you made. I haven't heard anyone say that before that we, that the obsession over what color skin someone is or race and ethnicity is dividing us further. Some people would think, well, we need to talk about it more. We, we need to uh, bring it to the light more. We need to protest about it. But that protest and the more people talk about it, it does become a bit of an obsession. Why do you think that obsession can become destructive? Because we're not relating on the level of human being to human being anymore. Yeah, okay. In my country, we're not relating as American to American. Yeah. We're relating on the level of one race to another constantly. It's not helpful. And, and I have to tell you something. I am apparently no, very few people seem worried about this. I am profoundly concerned about backlash. Okay, I am extremely, we're so obsessed with the idea of white racism and every white person is necessarily racist that I'm very concerned that there will be a, a you know, we, we have an alt-right in our country and I certainly don't want them to be strengthened by this. And But the identitarian politics is a very troubling trend right now. And the idea that it might start to attract not only the kooks that it currently attracts, but normal people who are just sick of being told that they're that they're bad people because of their skin color, that would be a very bad development. So I really, I would love to move off this race obsession and start dealing you know, with our problems person to person a, a lot more quickly than we are. So do you think that, it, that by obsessing about it and by separating people, it, it just marginalizes people further and they, they get forced into corners of like extreme ideologies? Is that where it goes or something else? Sure, it just increases tribalism. I mean, you're not, yeah, how can you be friends with someone? How can you, you know, there, the New York Times has written a constant stream of articles and a number of them now about, can you trust a white person? I, you know, some one person will write, I, I can't trust a white person. I'm a person of color and can't trust a white. This is not, I don't, I don't understand the value of this kind of thing on the op-ed page to begin with, but it's certainly not helpful for our society to constantly beat this drum that you can't trust people of you know the so-called majority race, um, I, you know I I can't imagine why you know that that the point of that is anything but a destructive impulse. Well, look if you look at any of the books you just mentioned, if you look at history, if you if you look at things like Robert Greene's work, that like you can see through history, that you you just can't trust human beings all the time. It's not necessarily always comes down to like a certain superficial thing, but it's more of a character value. That's right. And we're interpreting everything in terms of race. I yeah. mean, for instance, you know, people say obnoxious things to each other all the time. They say, you know, frankly, insensitive things to each other all the time. Sometimes that's motivated by race or anti-Semitism or whatever, but sometimes it's just awkward people and we're not allowing for that anymore. And I'm not talking about overt racism here, but when we're talking about the level of microaggression, things so small that you have to have sort of a guidebook to even understand where the offense is, um, you're, 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 you're not helping human beings be able to relate to each other. And I think just because times have been too good, Abigail, like things have been too good. Like we've had so many decades of like really good time, like in my lifetime, like your lifetime, different, like 
we're different, clearly different ages. Um, my lifetime, my generation hasn't really gone through a massive struggle, right? And so we'd look for things to find, to like, oh, the times are really good. Let's find things to pit against each other. But now we're actually having to face some struggle. It's changing. I, I, I believe and I'm optimistic it will change things for the better. You know, it's funny. I think that Gen Z, the so-called Gen Z and young millennial struggle is all internal. You know, I can tell you my generation, they're very reluctant. And they just came out with another one of these articles about how few people in America, it was specifically a survey of American millennials and Gen Z. Hmm. And a huge percentage, I think it was 20%, had never heard of the Holocaust and didn't know anything about it, or maybe it was larger. And, and they run these every so often, starting with the millennials to show how many people have never heard of the Holocaust. Okay, fine. It's one historical event. But why is it significant? It's significant because if you're sitting around obsessing about what's hard for you mm. without being able to put it in historical perspective, it's much harder to get past. We have to look to the times where people dealt with things that were really, really hard and look for inspiration because that's the only way we're going to get out of this rut of obsessing over the, the difficulties we, we, we have in our own heads. Absolutely. I think understanding history is like the gateway to a great perspective. And like I was listening to Jocko Willink's podcast, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, and he's talking about his time um, in Ramadi and overseas uh, and around Iraq and explaining the war and Saddam Hussein's reign. And it, it was very clear that, wow, I didn't really understand. You know, I was very young at the time and a lot of people don't understand how much of a maniacal, savage dictatorship Saddam Hussein um, had and the things he would do to people, just the pure, like we talk about evil, pure evil. And I feel we're so disconnected from that. I think that's right. You know, and I thought of another book while you were talking. I'll yeah. tell you a book that I think young women should read. Okay. And that's Pride and Prejudice. And I'll tell you why. Interesting. Young women need to read Pride and Prejudice because it's a story of a very strong woman who is really an absolute hero. She's a hero, very, very much the hero on the level of Odysseus, who saves her entire family through her smarts and her moral sensitivity. And it reminds us that this generation has the idea somehow that no women who came before it were worthy of honor or respect or admiration, but quite the opposite is true. The, the women who, who you know, came before us did some remarkable things and they wrote incredible books. And you know, when you, when you read things like Jane Austen and you, and you appreciate sort of a young girl's coming to terms with you know, her, her prejudice her hopes, her dreams, it reminds us that you're not the only one to have gone through yes, this. Yes, exactly. And some women have gone through it much worse. And you're also not alone. Who are then, who are the strongest women and role models that you've had throughout your life? What have they taught you? It's a really interesting question. I, th I think of Golda Meir a lot. Who's because, that? Golda Meir. Uh, Golda Meir, the prime minister of Israel. Huh. Um, and I do think about her because she was a young, you know, Russian immigrant to a uh, Russian immigrant to America who then left for Israel at, I think, 19 or, or something very young. She left for Israel. She hardly spoke the language. Um, and when she showed up in America, the, the she was trying to read. She was trying to uh, raise money for the Jewish state for what would then become the Jewish state. And she was very poor. They had no money. And she got up and she spoke to an American. She came back from America. She was very, I think she was in her early 20s and spoke to an American audience in Chicago. And on, on sort of the strength of her, her words and her commitment and her unflinching dedication to her cause, I think she raised, you know, a, a, a huge amount of, you know, I think it was on the order of something like what would today be $50 million or something. And she, she was able to do it because, you know, she really, I think her, 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 her she, she never stopped. Mm. She never stopped with, she was a completely tireless worker, completely devoted to our cause. And she was doing it to raise money so that the Jewish state could defend itself when, when it decla would declare independence and, and all the Arab armies would attack it. So I think it was a really remarkable display of courage and grit. And, and I look to women like that who don't stop 
um, certainly as, as inspirations for me. That's really interesting you say that because if there's one thing I've observed from you from afar, Abigail, is you are resilient. You just keep going. Like a person wouldn't, you have no like real incentive to talk to a person like me. I'm not, I don't have a huge podcast, right? And I know a lot of the people you talk to also don't, but you decide to. Why? Why? Like, why continue the conversation with and dedicate time like this? Because young girls are being hurt. Because we have an epidemic of young teenage girls being hurt and confused and nobody wants to talk about it. And I'm not doing it because of money. I don't know what people think journalists make, but they're grossly mistaken. And I'm not doing it because this has been so much fun getting constantly attacked. Yeah. But girls are being hurt. They're being hurt all across the West and they're being sold a lie that, that if they're not perfectly feminine, they're not really girls. And we need to stop this. And we need to stop letting the activists determine whether we're allowed to talk about the mental health of teenage girls. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're having these conversations and I'm very grateful for you. Um, I wonder, to finish off, are there any other women that you would point to for other young girls and women growing up um, to look to? I think there's no better woman to look to today than JK Rowling. Okay. I think she is a remarkable woman who had nothing to gain by standing up for women and girls. She had, she was beloved by so many. She is a remarkable author, one of the few authors of, of, of fiction that I can think of that we will certainly be reading in a hundred years, contemporary authors of fiction, I should say. And um, and yet she, she put herself and everything on the line to talk about what was what, the harms being done to teenage girls and to women. And I, I just have such admiration for her. I think schools should be named after her. And I think every girl should look to that to see what real courage looks like. Okay. And with the lies, I, I wanted it because I reminded myself when you were speaking, when I asked you about what your next book could possibly be, it's not to actually tell me what your next book could be. It was to highlight, and I want to touch on briefly, gender dysphoria, social media, the things we've talked about in this conversation, like those are some main pillar of lies. Is there any last thought that you have on a dangerous lie that isn't being talked about that you are thinking about potentially for the future? Oh, well, um, the one that I'm thinking about now, not, not necessarily to write on in the future, though I may, is that girls are constantly told now that woman is a victim status somehow. Okay. This is a lie. Um, it is not a victim status. Being a woman is a wonderful thing. And if you don't know women who have shown tremendous grit and courage, then you need to go out and meet some more women. Um, and the examples are all around us. And I think that that is something that young girls are told. They're told it in many ways. They're told through pornography. They're unfortunately taught through the culture that it's that, that they will all be abused and that they are victim status. But but it's you know, there is no reason to allow themselves to be mistreated. I mean, I look to the wonderful British feminists and, and there are some feminists in America, but but honestly, there's so many in Britain who are standing up for women and girls right now. And they, they have shown tremendous courage. And um, I think I think girls need to stop believing that, you know, that that women are, are, are aren't capable of that. Well, you demonstrate that. And uh, do you, what's the main like couple values that you have learned from your mentors like Goldemir, like JK Rowling, like what do you think they embody that you would teach to young girls? Uh, I, I just say at the end of the day, you have to do what you think is right. Okay. That's it. And all the noise and all the screamers, just shut them out. I mean, it, as best you can, because there will be screamers. You will have detractors. Every time you ever do anything that's right, that's what you're going to get. But y you know what? They're not so important and they're not so brave and they're really not worthy of your of, of, of stopping you. On that note, I would love to keep talking, Amber Girl, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, so thank you so much. I think that's a nice optimistic note to finish on. I think I've really enjoyed this conversation because I got to talk to you about some different things that you don't usually talk about and provide some different resources and like something practical for people. And, and I hope that was resourceful. And thank you so much for taking the time. Do you have any last thoughts, comments, questions, or asks of the audience or just where people can find you? 
Um, so my book's available on Amazon, Irreversible Damage. And since Amazon doesn't want to advertise it and <laughs> everyone's saying not to read it right now online, I encourage everyone to go consider buying a copy. <laughs> I hope they do too. Thank you so much, Thank Abigail. You. It was a pleasure and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are watching, talking or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. <laughs> we're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.